Good evening. I'm Mark Evanier, and I am not your host tonight for one of these broadcasts. Our host is this guy with a mustache I'm going to introduce. He, I am not the interviewer. I am the interviewee. Your interviewer is Mr. Sergio Aragonis. Sir, take over. You wanted to do this, so here we go. Uh, All right. The, the reason is that when you interview everybody else, you have so many stories and so many things that you want to tell that I think it's time that you are asked about all these questions. But all right. I know that the majority of people who are going to listen to us through the years, they know about us. They know about you a lot because you have a blog that has thousands of people, thousands and thousands, and is every day, and they follow it, and that you are in, in many ways very well known. So it is very hard to get into questions that the people are ready to know. But uh, if they don't know you, you go to Wikipedia and you'll find everything that you have to know about Mr. Evanier. Mark, how are you, my friend? No comment. Uh, no comment. I'm, I'm fine, you actually, you know? you I'm feeling fine, actually. I'm having trouble with my knee, the one I had replaced. But, you know, if that's the worst thing that happens to me, I'm fine. You know, yeah, it's just, because... I, have, I, have well, it, time, I have trouble walking. Yeah, but one thing I realized that now with the, with the coronavirus thing, we writers, artists, we still do exactly what we were doing to... Every, every time before, we're still at home, we work, we think, and that doesn't change that much. We have communication with our friends, we, we have them all over, and what we do is we miss them in person, We but because we go to the comic book conventions and we see them there. So that, that type of life hasn't changed that much. So, But what I want to know more, and I know a lot of people want to know, is when you were a kid. Because I don't think you were a normal kid. Because uh, I, I think I am still not a normal kid. That's uh, what I mean. So it's it's a big difference when you have a special brain like you have, and that is what is. I am very curious about it. When you were a kid, very young, very young, how you got involved in everything that you do now? How it started, and what uh, is the oldest thing that you remember getting into this? Uh, I remember when I was born, the doctor slapped me and I dropped a copy of Walt Disney's comics and stories I was reading in the womb. Uh, no, I just, um, I had very, very good parents. You know, a lot of people who will tell you that they had terrible childhoods. I had a great childhood. And um, I got interested in reading very early age. My parents were very library oriented. They would go to the library every week and bring home the maximum number of books you could check out. And they'd always check out a couple for me. So there was always, there were always two or three Dr. Seuss books and my phone ringing at the same time. This is a, this is a spam call. Anyway, um, so um, I started reading Dr. Seuss books and comic books at a very early age. When I was in kindergarten at Westwood Elementary School, the teacher was named Mrs. Barrett. I remember everything. Um, they passed out construction paper and crayons for us to do, draw on, and I wrote a book. For some ungodly reason, I decided to write a book on the construction paper with the crayons. The plot was shamelessly stolen from Dr. Seuss's The 500 Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins. <laughs> but as I later learned, there were people who made very good livings stealing from Dr. Seuss over the years. And... Mrs. Barrett saw this little book I had written. I, I actually went to her and asked if there was any way she could staple the pages together because they're all different separate sheets. And she looked at it. Now, there's this legend that you may have heard of where the premise is if you take an infinite number of monkeys and put them in a room for all e in eternity, uh, they will type all the great books. They will they will type all all, all everything in the Shakespeare, the works of Shakespeare. You have to have monkeys that live forever, which we <laughs> seem to do in Washington these days. But um, they will eventually type all the great books. And she reacted like a monkey had just typed, you know, Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> she was walking around going, "You did this. You wrote this. I, mean, I can't believe this." And she took it to the principal and said, "Look what one of my students did," and they started skipping me in grades. And that which young? was, yeah, yeah, I skipped, um, 
from kindergarten, you're supposed to go into B1, then A1 in the LA city school system, or at least that's, this was, you know, then. in the fifties. Um, and they put me right into A1 and then they skipped me over B2 and then they skipped me over B3. And then I had uh, scarlet fever for six months and I, I lost, I lost six months of school. I was out sick for six months as a young kid. So I, I, I ended up graduating a year sooner than I would have from, yeah, but, from high school. Didn't that change your relationship with other people? I mean, because well, when you are in a school, you grow up with them, a certain amount of things, things that you play, things that you talk about it. Didn't you put you sort of like in a different level with, with your contemporary kids? It, it didn't change my relationship with the other kids. I just didn't have one. I didn't have any friends. I didn't talk to anybody. Um, in, at, at recess, which is when you build your social network as a child, I had no one to eat with. I ate alone. And then when it came time for games that we played at recess and at lunch hour, I did not understand the games because I had skipped the grades where they teach you how to play the games. Mm -hmm. So like we, we had this game called Sockball that they played in the, on the grounds of West Elementary. It was, it was a variation on baseball where you took a, a ball, one of these big inflatable balls, and you socked it with your hand and ran whatever bases you could get to before somebody uh, tagged you with it or something. And I didn't always play. So I would go out in the field and just stand in the outfield the whole time. I didn't, I wasn't on either team. No, they hadn't picked, they picked teams and I wasn't on either team. So I just stood in the outfield all by myself for waiting for something to happen. If the ball came near me, I just batted it over to somebody else. And yeah. finally, one day somebody said, wait a minute, that kid there, who, I thought he was on your team. I thought he was, and I finally got dragged onto a team and I eventually learned the game, but I was the smallest kid in class, the youngest kid in class. Did you continue writing? Or did I, you I would write, but I would, would actually what I did, and maybe you can relate to this, is I, I started drawing. Huh. When I was, you know, five years old or six years old, I could draw Popeye. I would watch TV and I would copy the characters or I look at the comic books, especially. And I learned, taught myself how to draw Popeye. And I want to tell you, I still draw Popeye just as good as I did when I was six years old. <laughs> maybe no. a, tad, a hair better. The no, kids that love that. The, the yeah. fact that you can draw and 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 write at that at that age, what were sort of like what led you to continue doing it? What was what were you reading? What were you looking at? I was reading comic books. Excuse me. When 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 in your generation you had television, other uh, so what was it? Books or television or uh, what was it? Everything, all of that stuff. I watched every TV show I could watch, every cartoon show I could watch. I read every comic book I could get my hands on. I read children's books. I worked my way through all the Dr. Seuss books. I worked my way through all the Dr. Doolittle books. I worked my way through all the Freddy the Pig books. I worked my way through all those series for kids. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, you know, I just, yeah. How have you developed at that, at that moment? The memory to to because you have an extraordinary memory. What, was that from the beginning? Do you remember many of the things that you read and you draw? Yes, yes, yes. I remember uh, almost everything. I don't want to say everything because when people then when you do forget something, people think you're lying. But I I remember <laughs> I I remember books. I remember classmates. I remember teachers' names. I remember all sorts of incidents at, at Westwood Elementary and at. Emerson Junior High School and so on. Yeah, yeah, I just I just remember that stuff. When when with all these influences and things, were you ever reading anything serious? I mean, not serious. That comics are not serious, but I mean, other type of books. Like I was reading, I read Treasure Island. I read Robinson ah. Crusoe. I I mean, it, it, what happened? Actually, a strange thing happened. They for me, it was was very weird. They. Um, decided they did put me through these tests and they decided that I had the reading or writing abilities of a fifth grader when I was in first grade yeah. and, it, and they didn't want to teach me at a lower level than I was reading. So in first grade, they would, when it came time for reading the reading lesson, 
the, the equivalent of an English class, they would send me down the hall to the fifth grade class and I would take my reading lessons with them. Hmm. And I would then say, and I would ask, when I, when they set this up, I said, okay, what do I do year after next? Because <laughs> the school only goes to grade six. And they yeah. said, we'll figure that out then. But so, by then, were you still writing? I was still or writing. Just stuff. Reading? I, was, I was writing things. I, I was reading things and writing things. Yeah. Um, about age seven or so, uh, my parents took me to a play. There was a little theater group, one of these 50 seat playhouses that did an, an, a probably unauthorized adaptation of, once again, the 500 Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins, the Dr. Seuss book. And they had this, in the tradition of Mary Martin playing Peter Pan, they had a, a lady playing Bartholomew Cubbins, and she did this magic trick. The, the book is about this kid who has 500 hats, and he takes one off, another one appears on his head, he takes another hat off. And they had this lady who did a magic trick where she would just, you know, she kept taking off a hat and another one would appear on her head. It was actually the same hat. She would pretend to be taking this one off. And then she, you know, it was this, it's a, it's a trick Good I learned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I watched this thing hypnotized by this you know, wonderful show I saw. And then I went home and wrote a play of my well, own. Not only that, <laughs> I think that was the, the beginning of your interest in magic then. Uh, yes, magic. I was very interested in because um, I started watching magicians on TV. My one of the first things that I got interested in a lot was ventriloquism because of this man named Paul Winchell, who was on TV a lot then. This magical man who had Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith. And as you know, in my living room, I have Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith. That's I've got right. exact replicas of Paul's dummies, full size. Yeah. Uh, replicas. I every time I walk in there and see them, I smile. And every time my <laughs> cleaning, every time my cleaning lady walks in there, she screams. But um, uh, I and I would, was doing puppet shows and and ventriloquism acts for the neighbors. I was I was I I had puppets and I had ventriloquism stuff, and and I did. I was performing for my relatives and neighbors and things like that. Uh, so, and I so, was yeah. See, no, 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 no. What? So, uh, no, not interrupting, but when did at that at the same time comic books enter? Comic book, I was reading comic books all the time. Already, already, yes. My my father would buy me comic books. He would we we would go to um, at that time they sold a lot of comic books in in markets supermarkets, mm -hmm. and I'd go to a supermarket, and my mother would give me a buck and go, take me go over and buy some comic books, which at that time you could buy ten for a dollar new ones. And then we also had a couple of secondhand bookstores my parents liked to go to because they bought used books to read. My mother loved mystery paperbacks. And we'd go to this secondhand bookshop and she would buy a couple of paperbacks and novels and mystery, you know, the Dashiell Hammett or, or you know, Earl, a lot of, read a lot of Earl Stanley Gardner or people like that. And they would have comic books, nickel apiece, six for a quarter. And I'd always buy six comics, multiples <laughs> of six, uh, and take them home and read them. I always had more comic books than anyone I knew. Yeah. And, uh, and well, I absorbed... you still have them. <laughs> yeah, well, I got rid of some of them finally because they were, you know, too valuable to look the, the page through anymore. Yeah. I sold a bunch of them off. But uh, and also, but only ones that I had scans of or, or had, you know, computer scans of. So I can still read them anytime I want. But I was, so, so, you know, I was like a multimedia festival. I was reading comic books and watching TV, and, and, and I started collecting comedy records. Yeah, well, uh, I will go to that, because, but what about your social life? Did you play with other kids? Did you go outside and, and talk yes, about yeah, it? Or? Yes, yes. I, I played mostly with girls, because that's who they were in the neighborhood. Ah. Uh, but I, I, I played with girls, and they, uh, they loved you know, that I had comic books we could sit around and read and that I knew a lot about TV and, and that I thought of funny games and silly, I said, made up silly stories. Um, there were two twins who lived next door to, and they actually lived next door, their, their, their grandmother did, and they were always staying with them, Roxy and Lee. And we would, I would write plays and we'd do plays in the backyard. Ah. I would, Roxy, Lee and I would, would put on a play 
And and it was a little confusing for the neighbors that came to see it because they couldn't tell it just seen Roxy and Lee. <laughs> so, so uh, but, but, but uh, th that was the, the time also that probably you formed your your comic book club. The oh, the club that later. Club was it was when I was about sixteen or seventeen. Ah, we're we're talking about me being like eight eight years old here. Yeah. Uh, and so so you know I was reading comic books and I was reading regular books and I was writing little stories and I, when my mother passed away I cleaned out her house and and I found things I'd written and drawn when I was a kid. I found a Woody Woodpecker comic book I drew when I was about 6. It was it was a Woody Woodpecker adventure uh you know in crayon I just wrote a whole Woody Woodpecker. I just decided it was time that I did my own Woody Woodpecker comic book. So I wrote and drew a Woody Woodpecker comic book story. And um, then when I was about, I said, seven years old. And uh, 12 years later, I was writing the Woody Woodpecker comic book for real. <laughs> so we know now what, what the, the things that you do and why. That it was from early, early. Are you a member of Mensa at all? Or have you ever taken those IQ things? I, I, I took IQ tests and things like that. Yeah, and I was, I was, uh, I'm not, I'm not a joiner that way. But I could have joined Mensa. I could have joined a bunch of these different. I, I there was a period of time when at, at elementary school when they would take me out of class, and another girl named Jeanette Bingle who had already been been skipped in a few grades herself, and they would take us to special counseling. Some some special teacher would come and sit with us for an hour, take us out of our regular classes and like test us and give us IQ tests. And they were trying to see if the being skipped was causing us any um, educational impairment. And and I kind of tried to explain to her, no, but it's causing me social impairment. Mm. I would kind of like to not keep l losing my friends every year because suddenly I'm in another class. Yeah, but did you have uh, those people who bother other kids how they call them bullies? bullies because yeah. you were like a different from your average other kid. Well, a little bit, only a little bit. The problem was just it was a social malady. Being a year younger, you know, you know, right now, if you are with somebody who is a year younger than you, you are equals. When you're seven, a kid who is six seems like a baby to you. So, and also, I was a little smaller and a little weaker. I had a very very weak left hand for some reason it, it has gotten better over the years but i couldn't do anything with my left hand it was just this, like it was under muscularly underdeveloped so in sports that was a, a problem for me uh and also i was also and i still am enormously uncoordinated i could not ride a bicycle because i can't i can't i fall every time i try to ride a bicycle i just fell over all the time and sometimes when you're a kid, not being able to ride a bicycle makes you different. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Being able, not knowing how games are played makes you different. Well, but I, I compensate for that by, you know, yeah, but I can draw Bugs Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, in that moment, I'll say, let's go back to that type of age. Why you went into humor, of course, for the influence of the comics, more than any other series. What did you go into writing pirates or, or science fiction or something else? Well, Why well, humor? I, was, I was attracted to funny shows on TV and funny comic books, first of all. And secondly, I learned the value socially in class of saying something funny that made everyone laugh. Ah. I discovered a couple of times I would say something in class and everybody would laugh hysterically. But and you were I, not a clown in that class. You were not clown. No, I was you just, were I, fun. One time when I was about twelve years old. Now this is what this is one example of hundreds. But when I was twelve years old, we were studying the Renaissance, and uh, in class, and we had talked about the Dark Ages, and the. Teacher asked the, the, the lesson we were supposed to learn was that the Dark Ages were called the Dark Ages because so much of the teaching and education of earlier decades had been lost. 
So the teacher and the, and the teacher, so Mr. Klein, his name was, he comes out and he says, now let's discuss who here knows why the Dark Ages were called the Dark Ages. And I said, because they had so many knights, meaning <laughs> the K, knights yeah, of the yeah. K. And that got the biggest laugh you ever heard in your life at, at that moment in that class. And I came up with it fast. And you get status from stuff like that. People suddenly are going, wow, you're, you're great. I wish I could do that. You, 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 I found that um, social acceptance came with being uh, enormously entertaining. If you, could, if you could make your classmates laugh, they liked you. And I, and I knew enough not to be, be the class clown who did stupid things, but I would sometimes say very clever in, in that context, for, clever for an eight-year-old, clever for a nine-year-old. I'll, I'll tell you a story here, um, which I don't think I've ever told in public or in print or any place like that. When I was about nine or so, my mother took me to New York. And it was a trip to, it was a trip to three cities. We went to New York, Hartford, and Boston two weeks, uh, a couple days in each city. And the New York and Hartford uh, stops were for her to show me off to relatives I had back there who had, had allowed me to meet my grandparents, allowed me to meet my cousins and uncles, a couple of uncles and things I had. My father stayed back because once my father left Hartford, where he grew up, he never went back ever in his whole life. But my mother took me, and we went to New York City for, for partly relative stuff and partly sightseeing. And we went over to see a movie at, she was taking me to a movie at Radio City Music Hall, which had the big spectacle with the rockets and dancing and things before the movie. And we were walking through Rockefeller Plaza and a man with a clipboard came up to us and said, excuse me, would you like to see a TV show done live? This was when daytime TV game shows were done live. They were not taped five a day like they do now. They actually did them. You know, if the show was on at 10 o'clock, they did it at 10 o'clock. Like you and I are live right now on YouTube. Um, and, of course, nobody's watching Joe Biden. They're watching us. Yeah, right. So, uh, uh, and my mother says, don't you have to be, like, 16 to get into those? Because I was, like, 9 or 10. And, they, and the man said, well, he looks like a nice a behaved young man, I think we could make an exception for him. Well, what was happening was they were desperate for an audience for these shows. And the show they wanted us to go see was a game show called Concentration. And the reason there was no audience for it that day was that the host of it, who was a man named Hugh Downs, was out that week. It was his week off and it was a substitute host and nobody wanted to see Concentration being done live. And we asked, my mother asked, is it possible for us to go see Treasure Hunt? which was a game show that was on right before concentration on NBC. These are all NBC shows we're here. And um, we, uh, and it was hosted by a man named Jan Murray, who was basically a comedian. He was a very popular comedian of the day. And there were some people in the chat room who will know who, you know, Jan Murray was. And uh, so we, they took us up to NBC. We, we went up to NBC. They gave us a little tour of the studio, a little mini tour where I asked questions that a nine-year-old should not have asked about television. Now, which, which kind of broadcast cameras are you using? This Are you using the boom mics or using the lava layers? I, I knew stuff about television. I was reading about it. So, so, so I, anyway, so they couldn't get us into Treasure Hunt. They put us in the line for concentration. Concentration was taping in 6A at NBC, which is the studio that David Letterman was in and Conan O'Brien were in for years and years and years. Across the hall in 6B, this is getting too complicated, I know, but just follow. No, 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 no. Uh, it, is, uh, it's, it is amazing, your memory. You know, you, you remember. Okay. It is astonishing. You know, it is just okay. beyond yeah. comprehension. So, keep, so, keep, keep so going, keep going. In, in, in 6B across the hall is where they did Treasure Hunt. And so at, at, at 11 o'clock, they would do Treasure Hunt in 6B. And they would set up, they'd be setting up concentration in 6A. And then... During the station break, the crew that worked on Treasure Hunt would run over and man the cameras in 6A to do concentration while they started another game show in 6B, they set up. They were going back and forth across the hall. So we couldn't get in to see Treasure Hunt, and we're lined up a half hour early to go into concentration. There is a live TV set in the hallway. 
not a monitor, a TV set that's tuned to the NBC channel in um, New York. And the people who are going to treasure hunt go in and some of them didn't get in because, you know, TV shows, they always overbook so they can, you know, they'd rather turn people away than have empty seats. So they say the page there, the NBC page says to the people who didn't get into treasure hunt, just wait here. Mr. Murray will come out and say, and, and, and wants to apologize to you for not getting in. So we waited, they waited there. And a few minutes later, Jan Murray walks out. This is five minutes before he's going on live TV to, to host his game show. And he is wearing a bright, giant, check color, super colored sport coat that didn't matter because the show is in black and white. And he looks fabulous because he's got TV makeup on. And he's got, uh, uh, you know, he's got all made up and his hair is perfect. He looked really, a, you know, looked like a very handsome man. And he goes out and the audience just sees him coming and they all start applauding because he's a big TV star and a great comedian. And he says, makes a little speech. Everybody, listen, I'm sorry you didn't get in, folks. I want you to come back tomorrow, please, as my personal guests. And I will put you, personally put you in the front row to make sure you get the best seats. And he was very nice to these people who had waited in line for an hour and hadn't gotten in. And he goes down the line and he signs autographs or whatever they wanted, shakes hands, greets each one individually and shakes hands. With the, kind of, the kind of stuff you and I do at comic conventions sometimes. And he gets to the end of the line and then he comes back working our line across the hall, shaking hands with the people in our line. And he gets up to me and he shakes hands with me and says, ah, oh, young man, yeah, well, you're a little young to be seeing shows, but I'm sure that uh, they let you in okay. You know, he says something, anything he said to somebody, people laughed at. I mean, he was just charming and funny. And all this time, the stage manager is walking behind him going like, Jan, uh, uh, 45 seconds, Jan, the show's starting, you know, they're starting the, to do treasure hunt live in the next studio. And he's in the hallway. And the stage manager is going, Jan, you got to get in there. I'm, I'm pointing at my wristwatch here. I guess I'm not in the shot. To, she's pointing at his wristwatch like this, saying, you know, Miss Jan, come on, you got to get in there. And Jan's going, I got plenty of time. I got signing more autographs. I got plenty of time. And uh, and I'm like going, Mr. Murray, get in there. You've got to be on TV. Right? I, I, I understood that this guy was going to be on live TV in, you know, 18 seconds, and he's in the hallway. And finally, without blinking an eye, he turns to us all. He goes, thank you, folks. I, I got to go do a TV show. I'll see you. And on the monitor, Bill Wendell, who was Letterman's announcer <laughs> years later, is saying, live from New York City, it's Treasure Hunt with your host, Jan Murray. And I see Jan Murray walk into the studio. And I look at the TV set. And Jan Murray walks into TV. He walks out on live TV. It's like, it's like one of those movies where you see someone walk up and walk into the movie screen. And in a movie, I see a man walk into live television wearing the same coat, 10 seconds later, and, and the audience is cheering him and he's welcomed them, you know, welcome to the show, folks. And he starts talking. And I just stood there. I'd seen something magical. And I thought to myself at that moment, wow, I would like someday for people to be as happy to see me as they were to see Jan Murray. That thought stayed in my mind forever. I still to this day think about that moment. I thought, think, be cheery, be nice to everyone, be friendly, say something funny to them, make them laugh, uh, make them comfortable to be around you. It's happened, and, it's happened. It happens when you are at a comic book convention and we have that quick draw, well, you uh, come in and people burst into applause because they like very much what you do. <laughs> so um, for a number of years, Jan Murray was the host of the annual Chabad Telethon on TV. Um, and you, you know what that is? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Chabad is a Jewish charity. And they would do wow. this live telethon every year in September to raise money for Chabad is like a, a Jewish charity that took in people who were homeless or drug addicts or people who needed help. It was a support mm -hmm. thing. If you were desperate, your life got desperate, you'd go to a Chabad house and they would make sure you had food someplace or a place to sleep. And, and so they would have these charities. And uh, a friend of ours, you probably met him. You may remember Stanley Ralph Ross. Oh, yes, sure. Remember Stanley, Stanley yeah. was big, big, huge guy, TV writer, friend of mine. Stanley was, uh, would work on the Chabad telephone every year as a writer and an announcer, and then he would be on the phone banks 
he would um, uh, yeah, answer the phones. Who, he would yeah. answer the phones, and he had an interesting job because every hour or so, as they're taking, the people say they're taking donations on the phone banks on the telethon. Somebody would call up and start saying, "We're going to kill all you Jew bastards." Uh, Hitler had the right idea; we should eradicate the Jews, and they would switch the call to Stanley. And Stanley would get on the phone. And if you remember, Stanley had this gravelly, deep voice. <clears throat> you know, talk like down there. He, he did the voice of Lurch on the Adams Family cartoons. That's how <laughs> gravelly his voice was. And he would say, and he would get a signal to the stage manager who'd give a signal to the director to get a shot of the phone banks. And he would say to the guy on the phone, hey, you see that six foot eight Jew on the phone, that's me. Come down here to the parking lot. I'll meet you outside, and you say that to my face, fella. And they'd always hang up. <laughs> so, anyway, so I went down. Stanley got me into the Chabad telethon one year to help out. And I, I got him to introduce me to Jan Murray, who was the host. And uh, I went up to Jan Murray, and I told him the story of how he changed my life. And he, was, he, he, was, he started crying, and he hugged me. Uh, and I thought, that you, came, you come full circle that way. But... Um, that was, to me, uh, and exactly one of the great inspirations for you to do what you do. Things that get into your mind at that age, get a total fixation and says, this is it. This is yeah. what I want to do. Yeah, and because, because I knew I could never be a performer. And I don't want to be a performer. I've turned down chances to be a performer because I know I'll stink at it. But I wanted to have that, you know, just in whatever I did in life, I wanted to just, uh, it's you a know, relationship with a with the audience. Well, we, but you can have it on paper. It, you can have it, it on. If, if you are living your life right, then when you walk into a room, people go, "Oh, look, Mark's here," or "Sergio's here." Hey, isn't that great? Sergio's here. <laughs> you, 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 that's the goal. If you're not doing that in your life, if that if you aren't getting that in your life, you're doing something wrong. I think. So um, yes. That's, is that the kind of story you wanted me to tell on this? No, particularly. <laughs> I, I like them shorter, but oh, no. okay. I'll tell shorter ones from no, now no, on. No, 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 no. Which is perfect because you're going exactly the direction that I had a lot of questions, and you've been sort of like answering as you keep talking about why you become what you are. And now you have put a lot of them together. You have put your love for television shows, your love for cartooning, your love for writing, your love for the, 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 the relationship with television and everything. And and suddenly it's more focusing by yourself with, to the point that you are now 16 and you get to form a comic book club. I didn't start the club, I but I when I joined it, by that point, I'd had a lot of letters printed in comic books, in the letter pages, and they seemed to, the members seemed to feel, oh, he's important. He has letters printed. We'll make him the president. So I was <laughs> the president of the club, and um, and that gave me certain perks. One of which was that I got to meet our first and only guest of honor, who spoke at a meeting, a man named Sergio Aragonis. <laughs> Uh, I remember where, very I, well when I met there. And then later on, our officers were invited to go down to Irvine and meet a man named Jack Kirby. And I uh, went down to Irvine as the president of the club, and I met this guy, Jack Kirby. And both of you, in your own different ways, changed my life a lot. <laughs> you know, well, and, the, uh, and, and both of you were people who were enormously admired for what you did and respected by your peers and were... Uh, very, very. At the, we're kind of working at the top of the game in your in your chosen style of cartooning and his and his chosen style of drawing comic books. Yeah, and, tell this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But tell tell the people, you were also drawing and writing. I guess writing took preference of your drawing. Uh, you can you want to elaborate on that uh, and how come? Uh, yeah, well, I I did. I was interested in puppeteering. I was interested in magic. I was interested in writing. I was interested in drawing. And when time got tight, I decided I was more interested in writing. I and decided the comedians, that, what? For the comedians, the, the comedy, the writing about comedy, more well, about humor. The, I was more interested in writing funny stuff. Yeah, um, and that was just my natural. I was attracted to the funny comedians. I watched every comedian I could. When I was like 16, my best friend at the time was a guy named Steve Hopkins. 
and we used to go to the silent movie theater on Fairfax and watch it. old Laurel and Hardy films and old Harry Langdon films and old Buster Keaton films. Uh, we were both attracted to that stuff. And uh, yeah, I just, yeah. I, I, t talking about the comedians, I know there's a big difference between in other parts of the world, not only in the United States, what you call here uh, uh, stand-up comedians. We don't have that any place. It's mostly an American thing that probably was born on the on, on the vaudeville, or, or 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 even earlier. Yeah, in but vaudeville they in vaudeville they called them monologists. Monologists, oh, yeah. that's, that's a new word for me. But uh, there's a big difference between Laurel and Hardy, who were actors who did comedic bits and, on the movies. I don't see them telling jokes about. Uh, I went to the supermarket and I did this and did that and a lady come and that type of humor, which is prevalent on, on the American comedian that sits there and is a host on a television and tell stories about something that interested them, which is very strange for many of us because we're not familiar with that gender of, of comedy. We are more used to the old fashioned comedy. So wh why was for you more interested on the spoken thing? Because you have an enormous amount of friends and knowledge about comedians who do that stand-up comedian. That's what your movie, favorite movie, it, it's a... Uh, it's, it's a, a mad, 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 mad world, yeah. Because all the comedians that you love are in it. Yeah, but they're doing Laurel and Hardy style comedy. Correct. But the reason that you like them is because they are, you knew them before doing stand-up. Well, not all, not all of them, you know. Uh, Sid Caesar did sketches, and oh and yeah, Milton, Mer Milton Merle did sketches, and based on and, writers. Well, some of those guys wrote their own stuff and such. I, I, I uh, you know, Jonathan Winters kind of wrote his own material, um, in, when, as, a, as a, as a performer, <laughs> or improvised it. Yeah, no, I like funny people, and it doesn't matter to me. You know, if they, it's like in Mad Magazine. To, I've, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, I can like Mort Drucker, and I can like, you know, Antonio Porjias, and I can like Don Martin, and I can like the guy who does the stuff, the dumb things in the margins, and you know, and Jack Davis, and all these guys. They're different. They 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 arrive at their. Some of them write their own stuff. Some of them don't. Some of them are are, and everybody there does something that some somebody else can't do. You know, nobody else can draw caricatures like Mort Drucker. Nobody else can draw hinged feet like Don Martin. <laughs> nobody else can draw little tiny firing squads like Sergio. Whatever it is, they they all got their specialty and the thing that makes them unique. Yeah. But I can appreciate whatever they do, and yeah. I can appreciate stand-up comedians or Laurel and Hardy or and there's all these guys who, you know, have one foot in each field. My question was about did you uh, at an, any time instead of writing like comics. Were you interested in writing for those comedians? Yes. And I wrote for some of them. That was the weird thing. I was able to, the, the, when I started, when I was seven or so, I decided I wanted to be a writer. Yes. But I really didn't know what I wanted to be a writer of. I wanted to be a, I wanted to write cartoon shows because I loved Rocky and his friends and Huckleberry Hound. I wanted to write comic books because I loved the comic books I was buying. I wanted to write situation comedies because I loved watching Sergeant Bilko and the Honeymooners and shows like that. Eventually, the Dick Van Dyke show became my favorite TV show, which was about a comedy writer. Um, and I wanted to write books like I was reading, you know, like Dr. Seuss or, or Hugh Lofting wrote with Dr. Doolittle. And I wanted to write plays because I had seen a few plays and I wanted like plays. And I liked and I wanted to write stand-up comedy too, because I'd seen some funny stand-up comedians. So I kind of thought, I'm gonna be a writer. I'm not sure what I'm gonna be a writer of. Let's see what's a, what options are available to me when I get older. Let's see where I have access to to do to, you know, and I would have been very happy if I had just succeeded writing. Hanna Barbera cartoons, or just writing comics for Dell Gold T, or just writing, you know, for DC, or just writing stand up comedy. I was not expecting to do almost all of those things. Eventually, because, you did. Because I, because I lucked into them in different ways, meeting different people, and one job led to another. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, so. Um, at, at that moment, yeah. at that moment, what was your father's? reaction of you because he was still working my and, father yeah and uh 
he he had this kid who is not in relation to other kids like many many other kids. It's not kind of normal in the in the form that he does all the things. He's always already more older than his age because he's already writing. He's already has a decision of he wants to be, mm-hmm. and it's hard for a father, at least for mine. It, it was that your son is is a, not going to the normal way that is going to go to college and become a doctor. You know, you, you, suddenly you are in, in a profession that a parent is afraid that is not too stable in the beginning and what's going to happen, is he good enough? Or what was your father uh, moment at that time? Well, my father, you know, was a depression era baby. He grew up in the depression and he believed, as did Jack Kirby, they had certain things in their background in common. They were about the same age and they grew up in the same level of poverty. Um, That the most important thing in this world for any man was to provide for his family. That, that that you were worthless as a human being if you didn't pay provide the rent and you know your, if your kids didn't have money for braces and food on the table and you have must have a paycheck. My father worked in a job he hated. He worked for the Internal Revenue Service and he hated the job because people hated him. You know they, when they, when he when he came to see you, you did not react like, oh boy, it's Jan Murray. You reacted like the devil was coming to tell you you had to pay your delinquent taxes, and and people hated him. And he felt very bad about that. Um, a couple of times, he essentially had to foreclose on people and, and shut them down, or or threaten to put them in jail for not paying taxes. And he was very frustrated that if any of his uh, cases he was assigned were people who were f- friends with either Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan they didn't have to pay their taxes. The fix was in for them. He would go to some house. His area was Santa Monica and it included part of Bel Air. So he'd go to like Venice where the poor people lived and he'd call on some poor woman whose husband had run off and left her with six kids. She couldn't feed and she had no income. And he had to go to her and say, you must pay your back taxes and you must, you know, pay $50 a week for the next X number of months. And she would be crying and she finally, you know, and then he would go in the afternoon, he'd go to a house in Bel Air to a $5 million house, which today would be a $25 million house. And there's some guy who has not paid his taxes since the Truman administration. And my father would walk in and he'd see a picture on the wall of the guy in a tuxedo with Ronald Reagan or Richard Nixon or both. And he would know not only would this guy not pay his taxes, but this guy would, would call somebody in Washington and my father would be, would, would, would be ordered to write the guy a letter apologizing for harassing him. And it drove my father nuts. And he retired just in time to watch the Watergate hearings and to see a lot of this come out. He yeah, was but- very elated by that. Now, in my case, every writer he'd ever met was broke. That's every right. TV writer he'd ever met was broke. And he would, you know, and because he said to me, Mark, you know, I, you know, he he hated his job. He hated his profession, but he didn't see a way out. He had no skill that led him naturally to something he that he might love. He didn't, you know. It's like when I went to my 25 year high school reunion. There were friends of mine from high school who'd say to me, you know, "What are you doing, Mark?" And I go, oh, "I'm writing TV shows. I'm writing some comic books and things." They go, "Oh, good for you. You know, I'm still trying to decide what I want to do with my life." And I would think. You got out of high school 25 years ago. Why are you still trying to decide that? (laughs) Shouldn't you know by now? (laughs) I didn't say it quite that way. Um, So my father sat me down one time and he said, Mark, I want you to do anything you want with your life as long as you love it. And I said, I want to be a writer. He said, have you you got a second choice? (laughs) You know, and he was not that sure. And he was willing because I seemed like a bright kid. And I was a kid who never got in trouble. In high school, I never got into trouble. I never, there were never cases where he had to discipline me. There were never cases where he had to yell at me. My father never yelled. In fact, a few times he did yell at me, he apologized because he realized I was right. Um, Very fortunate. And so when I started writing professionally, I suddenly lucked into a lot of money. I was making three times the money he was the first six months I was writing. How old were you then? 17. And uh, I uh, 
and he was very guardedly like, but he, is, he, he didn't understand the concept of being a freelancer. To him, a job was something where every Friday they hand you a fixed amount of money. They hand you a check predictably, and you know exactly how much it's going to be. And I was making $400 this week and $700 next week and nothing the week after. And then I make $1,000. You know, it averaged out to more money than he was making, but it wasn't steady. And he thought, you know, it's like, well, you can't go that far on temp work. You, you've got to have a job someplace. And it's now been... Last July was 51 years. I've been a freelance writer. I've never been steady anywhere. I've never had been exclusive to any place. I've never had one source of income. Uh, I've never been out of work. So your father and was very proud of that. Eventually, he was very proud uh, of me. He fig eventually, it took a while. I had to I had to make money for a number of years before he finally said, I guess, you know, I'll tell you that the moment, the mo there, there were several moments when he accepted this, but I'll tell you the very strangest moment. Uh, I started writing TV shows when I was 23 years old. At that time, my father used to love, the one thing he loved most in the world that made him happy was going to Las Vegas about three times a year. He'd take my mother. He was retired by then, so they could go more often than when he was working. Um, and they go to Vegas. Now, when when I was living at home, you visited my old house where I grew up a yes, couple of times. Yes. Okay. When I was living there, they would go to Vegas twice a year. And I loved that because then I could bring a girlfriend over. I could bring girls over to the house. Um, once I moved out, that was not an issue. But um, uh, he went to Vegas and his favorite entertainer in the world was Tony Orlando. You know, who, you know who Tony Orlando was? Sure, sure. My father had a record of Tony Orlando's greatest hits. He would play it so often, my mother wanted to make a Frisbee out of it, just catapult it into the yard. He played it over and over and over <laughs> again. And uh, so it was their anniversary. Um, I think I was, it was their 25th wedding anniversary. I was 24 years old. And... Uh, I arranged for them to go to Vegas, and instead of staying at a little motel like my father usually did, I booked them a suite at Caesar's Palace. And instead of them going to like you know buffets when they had a two for one coupon, I arranged for them to go to a fine restaurant for dinner at Caesar's Palace. And I arranged for them to get ringside seats for Tony Orlando at Caesar's Whoa. Palace. And I was had a friend, a TV writer friend of mine named George Tricker, who uh, had written for the Tony Orlando sh TV show before I knew him. And I went to him and I said, can you help me arrange something? And he arranged it. That night in Vegas, my parents had ringside seats for Tony Orlando. My father was thrilled. Oh, my God. We're, there's Tony, my hero, Tony Orlando there. And halfway through the show, Tony Orlando says, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to dedicate the next song to two wonderful people who are out in the audience tonight celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary, Bernard and Dorothy Evanier. And <laughs> my mother s told me, you have never seen such shock on your father's face and such delight. And he asked them to stand up bow. My mother was too scared to stand up. My father stood up and took a bow at Caesar's Palace, the, the only time in his life he was ever applauded. The only uh, time in his life he ever heard. You hear audiences applaud all the time. You know, you, we do quick draw, and the audience, I say, ladies and gentlemen, Sergio Aragonis, and the audience goes crazy. This was the only time in my life my father was ever applauded. Uh, and, and Tony announced he was dedicating the next song to them, and he, was, and he sang the anniversary waltz. And my father sat down, and he had tears in his eyes, and he turned to my mother and said, I'm going to stop worrying about the boy. If he can arrange this, he'll be fine. <laughs> and that was, and that from that point on, our, my relationship with my father changed, thanks to Tony Orlando. Well, <laughs> it, uh, it is one of those moments that very few people can say, "This happened to me," you know. Yeah, and, and, uh, my, fa that, and my father and, and my father said he even pronounced Evanier correctly. Ah. <laughs>
<laughs> no, no, that's fantastic. But so now you are a professional. You are doing exactly what you like. You move. You do this. We have the conventions. What was the big change that makes you not choose anything? I mean, you you, you still write comedy. You still write television shows. You still do comedy. So you haven't changed that much on your activities since you were a kid. You're still doing. Yeah. Exactly like it. You are a total professional. You you are making very good money. You are very well known in the profession. We are now in a very difficult times, not only because of the pandemic, but politically and because of many other changes, globalization, technology. How you see what is happening to you? What are you aiming at? Are you still going to do the same ways? Yes. You, you, I remember something that I would like you to talk many years ago, talking about technology. I was at your home when, <laughs> yeah, when you bought your first computer. And yeah. I remember a gentleman who was the expert about it, put it on. Can you tell the story? Because you'll tell it much better than I can. Well, my friend Steve Gerber and I decided to get get word processors. And at that time, the, the computer market was a little bizarre, and we thought what we wanted were were word processors, not computers. Uh, a word processor did not get you on the internet because there really was no internet that people knew of. It was a very quiet little thing that didn't have any porn on it or anything. And uh, <laughs> so we wanted word. We were both working in cartoons together and writing comic books. So we picked out. We we both studied together, and we picked out this thing called the Lexa Writer. L e x o r i t e r. Um, and at that time, you know, you went to, you called up the agent and they said, oh, we will deliver one to your home and give you two hours of training on it. So you are, you were here the day they brought me my Lexa writer and the guy is trying to give me training on it. So now but, you, you pick up the story. No, no, there. no. It's, uh, this is the, the, the man, which is the expert explaining Mark and Mark telling, uh, excuse me, but if you press that button, wouldn't that be a little faster? And the guy goes. Oh, oh, yeah, and then you. But if you move that over there, wouldn't you already have already all that printed over there? And he was within ten minutes. That man was just sitting there listening to Mark explaining him how the whole thing worked. I was yeah. in hysterical because I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I still I, don't I, understand any of that. I, but. I, I picked it up very quickly. Occasionally, oh, it was amazing. I, I am so inept at a lot of things. I really <laughs> am terrible at so many things. You know, I mean, I've been hanging around you for 50 years. I still know five words of Spanish. I can't learn foreign languages. Thank uh, God, because I can insult you in Spanish without you understanding it. But uh, yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> anyway, but uh, no, I. Uh, you you I see the changes now? You you see what what's going to happen? What is your opinion about it? Because a lot of people are very concerned. I get letters about young cartoonists that. They still want to know what type of pen I use, you know. But what is the future right now on on the on on everything with the little telephones? Everybody wants everything happening in something like that. We put yeah. a lot of details in our work, a lot of writing, and they spend the whole time just being that. What is going to happen? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. You just have to stay on top of it. You know. I mean. I mean. Every iPhone I get does things the one before couldn't do. And I think, how do I use this in my life? How can I adapt to this? I, a, a day does not go by when I don't do something with a computer or my iPhone or uh, the equipment here I have here that I think, gee, 20 years ago, this would have taken all day. Or 20 years ago, I couldn't have done this. I mean, they're just, there are things that happen. Day, I am very conscious of this. Um, uh, here, I'll give you one example of 87,000. Uh, when Amber and I were in New York last time, uh, we went, I was doing a radio show. I was doing um, uh, John Fugelsang's radio show on XM Satellite Radio. So I was at XM Satellite Radio for two hours, and Amber went off to find a nail salon to fix a broken nail she had. And she got lost, and she was running in New York, and she couldn't find the building where I was, and I didn't know where she was. We had no way of getting in touch with each other except our cell phones. And I thought, and then, so when I got out of the radio station, I texted her, where are you? And she said, I'm not sure. <laughs> I said, okay, 
stay there. And I used the cell phone to locate her. And I walked to where she was. Now, if, if that had happened in 1975, how would we have found each other? Well, it happened to us. We were in a convention and you wanted me to meet on a place and I couldn't find a place. And with a computer, oh, yeah. you told me, just look up. And yeah. I looked and I was on the oh, But I mean, the I mean what, what, what you do is you become conscious of how great technology can be when you can control it and use it, when you can use it as an adjunct to your own thinking, where you can say, mm -hmm. all right, how does this help me? And how can this inform me? How can this help? You don't want to be a slave to the computer. You don't want to be following the computer or the phone. You want to be using it as a tool, a new what tool that can make you do something. What the about what? The, cont the content? I don't of, know what's going to happen what you're with, writing. Con with content. I mean, I mean things are just, look. Um, with the comics, too. Uh, look, uh, uh, not that long ago, you and I couldn't be doing this right now. With me, we're doing right it. now. I, I right now, we couldn't do, do this. And I remember the first time I showed you how to do this, you were amazed. I'm still uh, amazing. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, how you do that? You know. You so do. you, you, something new comes out, and you. But it's just like, I mean, there was a time in your life, Sergio, when somebody said to you, "Hey, you ought to try this new pen. Hey, you ought to try this new ink. Hey, you ought to try this new kind of whiteout. Maybe you want to try this new drawing paper." You didn't. You, you said, "Okay, let me see if this works for me." And you apply the same thing to the technology. You yeah. say, okay, how does this make my life easier? How does this make my work better? How does this let me monetize my work more? You well, are selling, you, we are selling GRU in ways we never sold it before. Yeah, and, uh, but don't way. forget that there's a big difference on gener generational differences. Even yeah. though we are, let's say, 20 years apart, that's one generation, a complete generation. Many people who are more technically oriented could enter very fast into the computer ages. In my case, I couldn't. You did. So that doesn't bother you. But more than the technical part of it is where is what you do going to change? Your, your yeah. politically correctness, uh, a new type of audience who hasn't read that much of the things they are more into the computers. Is that change your... When you sit to write, do you 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 are writing to these new people, or you will continue writing the way you've been doing it all the time? I can That's basically. My... Well, I write different ways because I now have different ways to write. I work differently on a computer than I did on a typewriter. And if you remember, you know, there was a time when I did a lot of grew in longhand. Oh, I would yeah. write it out, in, you know, in pencil, and and finally. It became easier. It, it was a time when I had to mail you or you had to come get pages from me and I couldn't email them to you. You and I can, you, you can, you and I can fix something. If, if I look at a page, you can mail me a page of GRU and I can look at and say, you can email to me, you scan it, you look at me and I go, Sergio, you left the spot off the dog you, under his eye and you fix it and send me a new page and we fixed it miles apart in you know four minutes. No, it's amazing. Uh, I send you the pages with the writing and uh, you absolutely change it on the computer and it comes and it's different gag or, or different composition. And you tell me these pages that you wrote don't go good there. You have to put them at the end and the stories be stronger. You are the editor of GRU and a lot of people don't know that. You know? There's no editor of GRU. That's a great part of GRU. It has no editor. <laughs> Or oh, we, have has, a, we have a good one. It, we, yes, we do have a good one, but but they don't have any input to the stories. No, no. Uh, but no, we no. kind of like see. Gru is one of the things I like about Gru, and this is, I don't want me to get off topic here. Is I get to, get to the point where I don't want to do comic books with strangers. I don't want to write a story and they give it to somebody I'd never met to draw. I did that for years. I was never that happy with it, and I'm to these days when I do a comic book, I want to know the guy and they have him. I got spoiled working with you and Dan Spiegel and Will Minio and some of the other people I worked with. I liked working with friends and getting on the same wavelength and being able to go to lunch with them and talk about the stuff. And I could call them and say, you know, um, Hey, would you mind drawing, you know, this, or can you know how to do that? Um, well, I've been, so, I've been so comf comfortable with you from the beginning because not only because of that English, but because of the writing style on comics and things that I never did before. 
when I write the stories, sometimes you change content on it and you change type of dialogue and you make some very funny gags. I couldn't work with anybody else, you know, because we are now like one person, you know, when yes. we do stuff. Yeah, and, and, uh, and and I and I get custody of the mustache starting next week. So all right. <laughs> Here, uh, it's fake. <laughs> uh, no, 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 you know, um it, there's something enormously fun about collaborating when you're really in sync with someone. Yes. And, totally, and totally. so totally. Gru totally. is is we've been totally in sync. We've had, you know, our little four arguments <laughs> all about all about things Gru was eating. <laughs> and the and the arguments collectively lasted about six minutes. That's, that's the, totally correct. But, Which, but but that's because um, we're not competitive. I yeah. defer to you on everything involving visual humor and gags and drawing and things yeah. like that. And you defer to me about the wording in a balloon here and there. But you still occasionally come to me and say, I don't understand that line. And you're right. I, you know, and occasionally I look at a drawing and say, I can't figure out what's happening there. Don't you want to put that there? And you go, oh, yes. So we, 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 we kind of edit each other that way. Yeah, but well, it, 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 is, it is hard to write in another language when you are not uh, ordinary know how to, to write in that language. So it's difficult. But the visual idea, that's still easy for with no trouble whatsoever, but um, we we are there's no nunca has been any troubles of any kind with us. Uh, do you have any questions from anybody? If there's anybody oh, watching, you want to oh, I haven't. I've I've kind of had one eye on the chat room here. Let me see if I can go through a lot of hellos from people we know here. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Phil Geiger is on. Phil, Phil Geiger is <laughs> online. Joe Music's online. Chris Sparks is online. Oh, Chris, yes. Holly Buchanan is online. Robert Rose is on. These people are on a lot of my. Uh, Chat. I'm just going to pick some names at random here. Uh, I'm skipping. Yeah, over. that's a good question. No, 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 no. Why, like Robert asked about children's book. Yeah, uh, uh, this is one question that I have all my life, and I asked you many times, but I want to ask it again. You have right the, the, the comics and this, but what about books related? Not about your knowledge about comics, because you have written like a. Uh, very didactic books about comics and stuff, but as he said, a children's book or or a poetry book or a book. Uh, you and I were talking about an idea for a children's book yesterday that I want to write. Yeah, but that's the one I write. But you are in your fifties. I'm. I'm, I'm in my sixty. I'm sixty-eight. I don't want to hear that. Yes, but uh, you you have never written any book like children's book or anything like uh, that. I did. Well, first of all. You know, I wrote Scooby Doo comic books for you. Those are for children. Yes. I wrote I wrote Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. Those are for children. And then I wrote a couple of activity books for uh, uh, different companies. I wrote a, a I wrote a Pebbles and Bam Bam paperback novel once. Uh, you know, there's lots of things I would like to write, and and you can't do everything. Aren't there things yeah. you want to draw that you don't have time to do? No. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, have, I have projects that I want to do that I don't have time to do, but uh, uh, eventually, probably I will. With things changing, I'll have more time. But this hold on here. I got I gotta find in the chat Ed room. Rose? I've got to find Robert Rose's email to click it off. Here. Ah, uh, I mean here, so we we don't have Roberts up there forever. Uh, oh. Where is Roberts? Email. I don't know none of that technical thing, so I cannot ever help Mark to do all this stuff because I barely can understand how this is happening. If my son-in-law didn't help me, I, I, I couldn't have put all this. Uh, uh, Trevor Kimball just asked, Mark, did you ever have an interest in writing a comic strip? Uh, I have ghost written several newspaper strips over the years. Uh, 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 Scott Shaw wants to know, Sergio, ask Mark if he's is, if he's written our obituaries yet. Well, Mark has a a, a column, which is a, a, how you call that, the blog. And in the blog, he takes care of people that we know, and he mentions he has obituaries for them. But uh, I wouldn't ask that question. I don't want to, I, I don't want to know. 
Um, the answer the answer is is I have written a few obituaries, but not yours, guys. Uh, oh I, I, yes, I, you have. <laughs> I actually at one point, someone called me up, and told me a prominent person in the comic book industry, someone I loved very much, was on death's bed. He'd go very soon, and I wrote it up. And I didn't get to post it, fortunately, for 14 years after that. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, but uh, no, I, I don't. I do. I once in a while. I don't. I don't have a. Uh, uh, anyway, I. I uh, uh, there's. Uh, we. Some of these questions have scrolled off here. Let me see if I can. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Well, the, the reason as, you know that, oh. so Rob Bernath wants to know: Has Mark ever spoken any school career days describing the writing career? Yes, y yes, I have. When I was in um, high school, a guy came in. Uh, we had a career day thing, and one of them was a guy who was a programming executive for uh, NBC. And he came in and he said uh, he was talking about. And I, that's, I, I chose of all the different careers I could have gone to. I wanted to find out from him. And he said that he said, you know, he talked about television and programming. He was, I think he was out of the network or about to be out of it. And he said, he said, every so often an idea comes along that is so terrible, I can't believe they think this is going to work. We, he said, we call them Marley ideas. Marley is the character who's dead in Christmas Carol. They're, they're de ideas that were dead from the beginning. There was no chance. He says, this is the worst idea I have ever heard. They're actually making a pilot. They, they read the script and they they didn't realize how terrible the idea was, and they're shooting a pilot for it now. You won't believe this terrible idea. They're going to make a situation comedy out of the movie Mash. And that's what I and what the lesson I learned from that is that nobody knows anything, as as William <laughs> Goldman says. Um, so. Uh, 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 Digital McCracken wants to know, Mark, have you ever written a PSA for anything? Uh, yes, I wrote some. I wrote the PSAs for the Toys for Tots campaign. Excuse me, what's a PSA? Uh, public service announcement. Ah, okay. Uh, and I wrote uh, some political things years ago. And uh, 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 okay, here's a question. Uh, Keith Gal wants to know, where did the mulch running joke originate? <laughs> well, what happened is, well, Mark can tell also the story, is that we were tr trying to get the name for the dog or the sage. And believe it or not, I had an idea for the name, but Mark came with it, the same one. And it was amazing. Tell them, Mark. Tell, tell, tell. Well, we the, we were, we were mulch turned up at an issue of Gru as a, to discuss the, uh, uh, the process of fertilization, and, and we just <laughs> began doing this. And the the real stupid thing was that at that time uh, we were being published by Marvel, and yeah. you sent your letters for the letter page to Marvel's office in New York, and every two weeks, so they'd stick them all in a bigger envelope and send them to me to put it together the letter page. And they were getting tins of cheese dip. People were mailing cheese dip. Uh, to Marvel, and they, they called me up and they said, would you like us to forward you the cheese dip? And we said, no, throw that away. We don't want the cheese dip. We're not going to eat it. Even if, I don't even like cheese dip, but grew, was, we had a lot of jokes about cheese dip, so people were mailing us cheese dip. So when it came time to get another running joke going, did we make it about Krugerans or Maseratis or no, we made it about mulch, and mulch. people started sending in little baggies of fertilizer. <laughs> and Marvel called and said, "Please stop making mulch jokes because the the mail room is smelling like a like a, a greenhouse." You know. <laughs> um, so um, yeah. so then anyway, when it came time to name the the sage's dog, Sergio says. I've got the name for him. And I said, I've got the name for him. And in unison, we said, mulch. mulch. <laughs> and that was it. So, so, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. so we, we, we one time, Sergio and I were in a Chinese restaurant, and we got the same fortune in our fortune cookies. And we stared at each other and went, we're, we're working together too much. We're, yeah, <laughs> we're, that's right. When that happened. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that yeah, was kind of scary. It's been, it's been fantastic. Also, one thing that we never mentioned is about, you great interest on musicals. 
You like musicals, yes. You love musicals. Yes. You, what, what was your first one you saw? You were very young, or well, that Bartholomew Cubbins thing I think was a musical. But um, uh, at a very young age, my mother took me to see the National Touring Company of My Fair Lady. Ah. It was at the Biltmore Theater, which is no longer there downtown L.A. And my parents had played the cast album, the Broadway cast album of that song, that thing so much I knew all the songs by heart. And my mother wanted to see the National Touring Company. My father, for some reason, did not, although he loved My Fair Lady. Um, so she took me to this thing, and she told me in advance the story. She ta taught me the story a little bit in advance. And she told me about this wonderful orange drink. She said, now, at the intermission, they serve this great orange drink. You're going to love it, Mark. You know, I, 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 I happen to like orange as a color. No, the same. Yes. Everything, everything <laughs> here is, many things in this house are orange. Uh, the only thing orange I don't like is the president. And the, uh, uh, and I loved drinking orange juice and orange drink. I, get, I gave up orange juice years ago, but I, I used to love, I used to drink gallons of it. So, or anything that was orange flavored. And uh, she kept telling me about this orange drink. She said, oh my God, when you get to the intermission, you're going to have this wonderful orange drink. And I'm sitting there and I enjoyed the hell out of the show. It was literally a very good show to, to see this. But I'm also sitting there going, and I get the orange drink. Here comes the, where's the orange drink coming? And at intermission, she took me out. We used our respective restrooms. And then she brought me this she took me over and she said, here's the orange drink, Mark. And it was the same orange drink they sold at lunchtime at my school. <laughs> it was the same brand. It was Newtson, Newtson, little old container of Newtson orange drink. And I went, oh, yeah, this is great. And I drank it. And <laughs> so I, I, uh, I loved the show. And then I went to see um, uh, other musicals that I liked. Uh, I had, my parents were not wealthy. But we had some rich friends. We had a couple of rich friends, and one of them was family was a family called the Zuckers, Ben Ben and Betty Zucker, who owned a chain of the Zuckers department stores that were big around Southern California back then. And the Zuckers had a lot of money. They lived in a house that is across the was across the street from where Jay Leno now lives. That should give you some idea of the money they had. And when I was a kid, um, the day Kennedy was shot, the day John F. Kennedy was shot. Uh, was you know a, an earth-shattering day in our lives, all of us. Every if you were alive at the time, you remember where you were when you heard it, and, and you remember sitting at home, staring at TV with a gog and horror, and thinking the country is falling apart. This is the end of America. Thank God we don't think that anymore. And uh, the next night, um, the uh, Zuckers had tickets for a benefit screening of the movie it's a mad 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 world which had just come That's out right. and the, the zuckers didn't feel like leaving the house they were so depressed over watching the news they called up my father and said would you like these tickets and my father never turned down anything that was free so we ran over to their house and got the tickets and went to the show and this is when i first saw it's a mad 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 world and it was one of the great evenings of my life uh, and yes, maybe it had something to do with what night I saw it, but I just became enamored of the movie and I loved it. And it, it changed my life as a writer, as a person interested in comedy. Uh, uh, I, and I, it, it is, I am so happy. One of the happiest things I have done in my life in the last 20 years is that I'm on the commentary track of the Criterion DVD. It gave me a certain closure, all this obsession with the movie. I felt like I can pass this on to other people. And I'm, I'm a little part, I'm thanking the movie by doing the commentary track. And then in 1970, uh, the Zuckers had tickets for a production down at the Amundsen Theater downtown of the, the musical, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, uh, which, uh, uh, was starring Phil Silvers, who was one of my favorite comedians, who also was in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And the Zuckers gave us tickets to go see the show. And we went, and I knew nothing about the show. I had not seen the movie version of it, which I later realized was not very good. Uh, but that night, I, I, I assume anybody who knows who Phil Silvers was will believe me when I tell them that Phil Silvers was ridiculously funny in this part. He was so good, you could not believe it. And he had on stage with him, he had uh, Larry Blyden playing Hysterium. He had Carl Ballantyne, who was who I got 
got to work with a lot over the years and, and, and loved dearly. Uh, uh, playing uh, Marcus Lycus, he had Nancy Walker was playing uh, uh, the uh, the mother. Uh, Lou Parker, who played the father on That Girl, was playing the father. Um, and they had these gorgeous, beautiful women on stage playing the the courtesans, wearing very little clothing. Uh, it's, it's my two favorite thing: old Jewish comedians and women wearing very little clothing. And the woman playing uh, Gymnasia, who was the dominant, you know, she had a whip. She was a tall, blonde woman. She was stunningly gorgeous. And I just sat, we had second row seats. And I just sat, sat there like, you know, 12 feet from her going, oh, my God, look at that woman. She's gorgeous and terrific. Where is that woman today, Sergio? Right now, making dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Sergio married her. Uh, um and I'd seen her in other shows before that. And She's after that, terrific. she was in uh, Charlene Ryan. Uh, she was in um, the National Touring Company of Chorus Line, which I saw at the Schubert Theater. And I recognized her. I, I, you know, I read program books, and I went, "Oh, that's the same lady who was in uh, yeah, you know, uh, Forum." She and was in the original was, Chicago. And she was in the original Chicago. She's in the Sweet movie Charity. of Sweet Charity. Right. Uh, she was in a lot of. Very great Broadway shows, yeah. uh, and you had to be to, to be to be choreographed by Bob Fosse. I mean, yeah. you, you couldn't be a lousy dancer being a Bob Fosse show. No, 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 terrific. And so then one day, Sergio was working on a live action pilot of Little Abner, and right. he was introduced to the lady who was doing the Julie Newmar role, Stupefying Jones, and uh, he came over to my house afterwards. He says, Mark, I just met the most beautiful woman in the world. She's stunning. I, I just want to marry her. And I said, really, what was her name? And he said, well, you would never heard of her. She's a dancer named Charlene Ryan. I went, oh, yeah, I know who she was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, amazing. She's yes. a terrific lady. Yes, she is. Yes. Uh, you finally, yes, you found a, a perfect mate there. How long have you two been married now? How long have you two been together? Oh, since the 80s. Yeah. Early, late seventies. Okay, that's yeah. pretty damn good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't. don't hold, I don't. I don't hold on to mine that long. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't have to ask you more about Orange. I don't have to ask about Charlene. I don't have to ask you more uh, this and that. So I'm. The questions that really intrigue me, you have answered them all pretty good, because after that, your career is is an open book. You know, anybody who wants to know what's been happening, you are there. And the conventions, you go to, you are invited. You never sit for too long. But you have so many panels that you do. You you interview people. You do the panel about uh, Jack Kirby's. You do the uh, the voiceovers because you you direct voices. You are uh, very, I mean, you you are known in the business. Very much because you do the you direct the voices with uh, with Garfield and all that. So you do panels about voices overs. You do panels about Gru. You do panels about cartoonists. You do I don't know 17, 18 panels in every convention. Uh, do you have any specific reason that you is it because you like to be there and telling people, or you like to interview them, or? Well, I have been as you know to every San Diego con. Yes, and. Um, around around the mid '80s, I started getting bored with them, um, and I started I started skipping Thursday and I, going down Thursday night instead of Wednesday night. So I missed Thursday completely, and I started leaving halfway through Sunday. I was kind of paring down my uh, tennis there, and I was kind of like thinking, um, "Why am I here?" Um, because I was, I loved meeting people in comics who I had never met people, you know, artists, writers, people whose work I admired and talking to them and, and learning about how the comics were done and learning essentially, you know, how did you feel about doing this? Why did you do this kind of work here? Where I was trying to kind of understand why, you know, the artwork this guy did for this comic book was so much better than the artwork he did for that comic book or what had gone wrong with the comics that I didn't like and what had gone right with the ones I did. And I was interested in that. And I liked seeing friends of mine 
but I still had these long gaps at the convention where I didn't have anything to do. And I didn't want to sit behind a table. They kept trying to give me a table. And I think, you know, and this is no reflection on you or any of our mutual friends. I think the dumbest, most boring thing in the world is sitting behind a table waiting for people that will ask for your autograph. I want to disagree with you. Uh, okay. I don't like it. I don't like doing I it. I, I don't, it. Okay, fine. That's you. Uh, I just don't you. like it. Yeah. I, I don't like it. Um, I don't, if people ask for, you know, if they ask for the, I'm glad to sign it for them, but sitting there like, you know, come get my autograph, come get my autograph. You know, I, I, I don't like that. And well, that it's more, it's more than the autograph is to me when I see the people that come and ask for the autographs, you know, some are collectors. It doesn't make a difference, but these are people who come and you can see in your eyes that they like your work because yeah. it's a solitary work. I mean, I sit here more than eight hours a day drawing and, and writing. It, it is the fact that you go there and for a minute you see these people who come with their kids and the kids already like it. And, and, and you can tell that what you're doing has a reason to be, besides your own satisfaction of doing it. But the fact that you know some of the people who love your work, that to me is priceless. That's fine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the people who... I'm talking about the gaps when nobody wants to talk to you and you're still sitting behind the table. And I'm talking about the time when people come up to you with a pile of your work and you know it's a dealer yes. who, yeah. who, who somebody said, here, go over and get these signed by Evanier because they'll make them more saleable in our store. And suddenly somebody walks up with, yeah. you know, you and I have occasionally, we did a couple of times when we did a convention. And we sat there literally the entire convention signing our names. And we were, remember that convention we went to in Seattle? They, they took us into the convention. It was a Sunday convention, one day Sunday convention. And they flew us in Saturday night and they took us to dinner and they took us to the hotel. I remember you and I went off to our respective rooms and worked on Gru. <laughs> the next morning we went down, we had breakfast with Don Rosa, who was another guest for the convention. They took us to this hall where the convention was, and, and the convention opened at 11. They got us there at 10, and there was already a line at our table, big banner, Sergio and Mark, to sign comics. And there was already a line, a half-hour line of people there because dealers had gotten in early, and the dealers had sent people over, or dealers were in line for these things. And we sat down, and we signed our names. All day, they brought us Burger King for lunch. They wouldn't let us leave the table. <laughs> and at the end of the day, uh, we finally had no line. The line was at one point like 45 minutes. And I'm just signing and signing and signing. And uh, finally, there comes a point when the line finally got to an end. There was nobody else in line. And I turned to you and said, okay, look, I'm going to walk around the convention. I haven't seen any of the convention. I'm going to look around a little bit. And I got up, and the convention was over. They were, had packed it all up without us noticing. The convention had ended at 5 o'clock, and it was now 545, and there was nothing of the convention to see. And a guy walks up to us and says, okay, guys, come on. I'll take you to the airport. And I thought, why did we do this? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, it's fine to sign a couple comics for someone who wants to talk to you. But when the line was 45 minutes long, you and I couldn't sit there and talk at length to anybody. No, no, no. That, things like that happen. But we digress because you were going to the point that why you do the, the panels. Oh, and so anyway, so so the convention was asking me to do panels and I like doing the panels. I suddenly thought, oh, I've got um, something to do. I felt I felt useful. I had a room to be in. I, I you know, everybody, you know, you, I can't, I can't stand uh, since I, since I, since I don't have a table, won't take a table, that I have no place to sit without being yeah. in the way. I mean, I even feel like I'm in the way sometime when I'm sitting behind your table or Scott Shaw's. Uh, and but now I've got a place to be. Yeah. If anybody wants my autograph, they can find me because they've all got a, a, a printed schedule that tells them where I am for most of the day, and. Uh, I can sit there and I can in, in, interview. I mean, look at the people I've gotten to interview. We did. A, I interviewed Harvey Kurtzman. I interviewed, you know, Frank Miller. I interviewed uh, Carl Barks. I interviewed uh, uh, everybody in comics. Was I interviewed Al Williamson. I interviewed all these guys. I interviewed Will Elder. I interviewed all these guys I got to talk to. And yeah. I also had the fun of 
feeling like I was giving the convention a little entertainment because you did you do, you do because you you get the panel for instance the, the the panel that you do with the voices believe it or not is the largest room at the convention in San Diego and it gets full no no the, it isn't no no hall hall H and Baldwin 20 are both much bigger the the one that we do with uh, with the, uh, the, quick, room, the, the room we do quick draw draw in is the largest room in that section but wow. over at ballroom 20 in the uh hilton or actually in the annex now and the annex. Uh, they, it, anyway yeah, but the convention itself it seats there are, more there than are 2, people well the the hall h seats 6000 people you know and 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 that's the that's the that's the place where the people you know plug in the new current movies do and oh, I've never even, spent the night and, over there. Too. And, and I've been at every damn San Diego convention. I've never set a foot in Hall H. Neither have because, I. Because it doesn't, it doesn't relevant. You know, the, the convention is so many different kinds of conventions. There's so much there that doesn't interest me and so much of what I do doesn't interest other people. You know, uh, like people will say to me, oh, Mark, I'm glad you're going to be at the convention. The convention will be nothing without you. I go, no, the convention doesn't matter. No one person matters. You know, no. nobody matters. You know, I mean, there's 130,000 people at the convention. I don't have 130,000 people at my panels. Maybe over the course of the four days or five day, four days there, maybe 8,000 different people come through my panels. That's a very small percentage of 130,000 people. But that's gigantic. That's enormous. Well. Quick draw is a lot of fun. The cartoon voices panel are a lot of fun. Certain things are a lot of fun. We had this thing year before last where we had this woman who would, one of the writers of Wonder Woman in the 1940s who had never been to a convention. Her name was Joy Murchison Kelly. And I can't tell you how thrilling it was to bring this woman out. And I, I, get to, I got to call her up and say, hello, you don't know me. Would you like a free tr first class trip to San Diego? <laughs> and and we'll, you'll be applauded by lots of people. Um, and she, uh, can you imagine having the best day of your life and you, when you're in your nineties and you, it's not something you saw coming out of nowhere, no, no, somebody no. invites you to be wined and dined and treated like a queen and applauded and get standing ovations and sign your autograph. And, uh, so that was just, you know, um, uh, it's fun to do that. And I, I feel I have a function there because, because the kind of comics I write, are not the high profile ones. Uh, and I like it that way. Yeah. I write comic if, books that don't sell very well sometimes. Uh, if, you know. if you have any more important question, I think it's, I don't have any more questions to you. And uh, I think if they want to know more about you, they can well, go let, to let me, let, me take a, let me take a few questions from people in the audience here. Um, let me see here. Uh, uh, Joey Robinson says, this, Mark, do you have any good Alex Toth stories? Um, there are great Alex Toth stories to read. I'm not sure there are great Alex Toth stories to tell. Um, <laughs> yeah. He was a very troubled man. I've never known anybody so talented who was so angry about everything. I want to know more about you, not about the other people. Go, go to another question, please, please, please. Okay, please. Let, me, let me, let me, let's see here. Okay, let me find. Uh, uh, Mark, will you return for the Garfield series and Nickelodeon as the writer? And will the old characters from the Garfield show come back to the new series like Winona and Abigail? Uh, the answer is I have no idea what they're doing. They haven't, they haven't called me, and I don't expect them to call me. I think, I think I, my days with Garfield may be, may be done. Really? Uh, I should have known that more? I could have asked you more about that, too. Do you have yeah. anything to say about that? You want to no, comment? You know, I had a good run over with it. I enjoyed doing it. It was one of my favorite things I've ever done in my life. And uh, uh, if they call me, great. If not, you know, if you do enough different things, you don't you don't care that much about losing any one of them. And and uh, and there's another cartoon show coming up that I you may know about, Sergio, that that I might be doing, and uh, we'll see if that takes its place in my life. We'll see. There's plenty. To, there's, there's always something more fun to do out there. Um, let me go here. Uh, such. Uh, uh, Carlos Brossa says, greetings from Brazil. We have Nobody Brazil God. online here. Uh, why aren't you watching Joe Biden? Uh, and let's see. Uh, 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 let's see here. Hold on. I'm scrolling through. Uh, 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 Holly Buchanan says, hey, that Sergio kid's not too bad at interviewing. He might have a fallback if the art gig falls through. <laughs> Please. Okay. 
Uh, Des R says, meeting Sergio at ECCC. That's the um, uh, Emerald City. Um, that's Seattle, right? Emerald City come, was one of the most memorable moments of my life. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Robert Rose is very glad to get Sergio's autograph on some group paperbacks at his table some years back and shake his hand. Okay, that's nice. Thank you years ago, when, when I first met Sergio, this book had come out, his first paperback called Viva Mad. And uh, I had a copy that he had autographed to me and done a little drawing inside. And my friend Rob had a copy that he had autographed. And when I went to a secondhand bookshop and saw a Viva Mad, and I would always look at it. And frequently it was signed, you know, to, by Sergio to somebody, and I think, if, and I what I should have done is if I saw like you know to Ralph from Sergio, I should have bought it and waited till I found someone named Ralph to sell it to. <laughs> so we're standing, Rob and I are standing out front of my house. It's back when I lived with my parents. One day, waiting for the mail because back then the mail used to come. You know, remember remember when the mail used to actually come, and uh, it does. Uh, and and we were talking about uh, how. Uh, everybody we knew had a Viva Mad autograph by Sergio. And I said, it's like amazing. He signed, it's like he signed the whole press run. Just then, I swear to you, this is true. My mailman walks up, and he knows I'm into comics because he sees what he delivers to me. He says, hey, I thought I'd show you something. And he pulls out of his little carrier uh, wagon a copy of Viva Mad, and it's autographed from Sergio to my mailman. There's a drawing of my mailman in there because Sergio was living, you were living on Olympic Boulevard at the time. You yes. were... You were about a half a mile from me, and my, the mailman had switched routes. Your mailman had become my mailman, and my yeah. mailman had a copy of Viva Med <laughs> signed by Sergio. Yeah. Uh, I, what Mark says all the time is that if you find a copy of Viva Med without an autograph, it's worth more than the autograph once. That's right, yeah. Yeah, Sergio went to the printer, and as they came off, he just signed every copy <laughs> of it. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Chris Sparks asks, do you have yes. time to tell us your time on the D and D cartoon, the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon? Um, I spent a, a whopping ten days of my life on the Dungeons and Dragons show. Um, uh, Marvel Comics, but Marvel's animation studio called me and they said, "We have this show. We've been trying to sell it to uh, CBS. We can't get them to buy it because they don't like the pilot scripts we've written, and they like your writing." We'll give you a ton of money if you will write the pilot script. And I said, how long have I got? And they said, about three days. And I wrote the pilot script, the Bible and the pilot script in three days, and CBS bought the show. And uh, I wrote one other episode and then was done with it because I had other projects at the time. I was jumping around to, to different things. And that's really all I know. The, the, if you like that show, most of the credit goes to the people who produced it, Hank Saroyan and Bob Klein, who designed a lot of it, and Bob Richardson, who produced it, and Steve Gerber worked on it a bit, and all these other people who, who worked on it after I left. I just started it and, and got out. Um, then Joey Robinson says, can you talk a little about the end of your awesome Blackhawk run? Yeah, they um, – DC at the time, I was doing Blackhawk for DC – editing it and writing it and Dan Spiegel and various great guest artists were drawing it, including Alex Toth who did a couple of stories for us. And uh, uh, the book was, DC was publishing Black Hawk without thinking it would sell. They were, had brought the comic back in the first place for licensing reasons. And they were going to give it to a writer and artist team people they had under contract that they didn't want to put on the important books. It's like, oh, we got to give this guy work. We'll have him write it, and we got to give this guy work. We'll have him draw it, and it will not sell, but will keep the thing going for licensing purposes. And Len Wein, who was a big fan of Blackhawk, went in and made a big sting and says, you've got to give it to somebody good. You can't do this to Blackhawk. You can't, you know, you'll never publish it again because it won't sell, and it didn't sell the last time. It didn't sell the time before. You know, you'll never try it again. So he talked them into getting a decent writer-artist team on it, which was not us. And then the writer got pulled off for another project. The artist got pulled off for another project. And suddenly, Dan Spiegel and I had it. And since DC didn't expect it to sell at all, the fact that it sold somewhat decently and got some critical acclaim impressed the hell out of them. And then one day... Uh, and this is, you, you could guess for a, 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 a month and not understand why that comic ended. Um, they started talking about canceling it 
because uh, at that time, DC made a very large part of its profit by selling the reprint rights to their comics to Germany. Germany was a big, paid very top dollar for the right to reprint Batman and Superman, and it, it was a very substantial amount of the profit, or, or at least it, it helped make those comics profitable. And somebody in Germany went, wait a minute, this is a comic book about killing Germans. We shouldn't publish this. So they stopped buying the German rights to Blackhawk, and that made the, the comic now a loss for them. And DC said, we're going to cut it back to bi-monthly. And, and I knew that the, that the, it wasn't going to say, anyway, I, at that point I had um, this thing I was thinking of doing for Eclipse called Crossfire with Dan Spiegel. And I called Dan and I said, here's the book I want to do. Would you rather do this or Blackhawk? And I think Blackhawk's going to go away. He said, let's do Crossfire. So we, we left Blackhawk. They had another, they tried to keep it going then for a while. They got another team to do three issues of it. And then they junked them. They read them and they went, ah, people won't buy this. And they never printed the other people's work. And that was the end of that run of Black Hawk. Yeah. So. Black Hawk was uh, one of the very early comics, American comics that came to Mexico. And they were translated into Spanish, Los Halcones Negros. And it was one of the very few comics that I read uh, as a kid uh, from the United States in Spanish. Batman, uh, Little Lulu, Donald Duck. And the Blackhawks, they were my, my favorite ones. And it was drawn by a magnificent artist that uh, they changed later. But uh, the first one, that was amazing. He always had the positions like that. He was a great artist. What was his name, Mark? Uh, the guy uh, who drew it in the beginning. Was it Mexico? I don't know. No, no, it was an American comic. Well, the, the, the original American comic was Reed Crandall was the name. Reed artist. Crandall, that was it. Yes. That was it. I couldn't remember yes. the name. Reed yeah. Crandall. He drew it in the forties. He yes, drew it in the forties. Yes. Anyway, forties. Um, anyway, that's very good. We have to turn this over because if not, we'll be here the whole day. Yes. Um, uh, let me just say to everybody here. First of all, if you came in in the middle of this, this video will repeat almost immediately in the same place you're watching it now, and it will be on YouTube for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed this. This was kind of fun. It was. Uh, yeah. This coming uh, Saturday, I'm doing a panel online, a Cartoon Voices panel with agents and actors talking about how to break into the field, how how you get an agent, what it involves is involved in the profession of being a cartoon voice actor. It's not an entertainment. We're not going to do funny voices and read scripts. We're going to talk about the actual nuts and bolts of the business and auditions and, and training and professionalism and such like that. And if you're interested in how the business works and you, or you've ever thought of getting into it, this is a place for you. Next Tuesday, I'm going to return to my role as a host and I'm going to do an interview here with a cartoonist who draws almost as fast as Sergio, a man named Mike Peters. Oh, he he's the, funny. Please, please, please. You have to make him bow when he comes in. <laughs> he is just sensational human being. Besides a great cartoonist, he's a great human being. I love that man. So, anyway, um, Mike is a very, very clever man. A yes. Pulitzer Surprise winning political cartoonist. He's the man responsible for Mother Goose and Grimm, a uh, newspaper strip that I always loved, and which I helped turn into a cartoon show for a while. And uh, Mike His political is, cartoons are excellent too. Yes, they are, and he draws damn fast. Yes. So very good. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be your uh, interviewer. It was great. I had fun. Please, I hope I hope people people enjoyed this, and uh, we will see you uh, another time. Okay. Very soon. Right. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Adios.